Namaskar, a warm welcome to World News and Indian Perspective on All India Radio. This is Manoj Singh Rana and with me is Anita Anand bringing glimpses of the major developments of the day from across the globe. Over the next half an hour, we shall bring you the latest from the world of politics, economy, sports, entertainment and more. The headlines. Prime Minister Narendra Modi congratulates Nepali counterpart Sher Bahadur Deuba on winning confidence vote. Both leaders agree to enhance bilateral cooperation. Afghanistan condemns Pakistan's remarks on ongoing investigation into the abduction of Afghan ambassador's daughter as unprofessional and premature. U.S. and its allies join in condemning China's malicious cyber activities over the Microsoft Exchange server's hacking. India's Communications, Electronics and Information Technology Minister denies all charges of snooping as false and baseless. England moves into step four of its roadmap to end COVID-related restrictions. Over 41 crore doses of COVID vaccines administered in India under nationwide vaccination drive. And in cricket, India will take on Sri Lanka in second ODI of three-match series in Colombo on Tuesday. As the nationwide free COVID-19 vaccination campaign at government facilities for those above 18 years is underway, we advise our young listeners to get vaccinated and also to help others to get vaccinated. We also advise our listeners not to lower their guard as COVID-19 remains a threat to our health. Please stay at home unless it is essential to go out and continue to follow these three simple steps. Wear a face mask, maintain dogas ki duri for social distancing and focus on hand and face hygiene. For any COVID-related information and guidance, contact National Helpline numbers 11 2397 8046 and 1075. And now the news in detail. Prime Minister Narendra Modi on Monday congratulated Prime Minister of Nepal, Sher Bahadur Deva, on winning the confidence vote in Parliament. In a telephonic conversation with Prime Minister of Nepal, Sher Bahadur Deva, on Monday, Mr. Modi conveyed congratulations and best wishes to Mr. Deva for his appointment as the Prime Minister of Nepal. Recording the unique and millennia-old people-to-people linkages that underpin the special friendship between India and Nepal, the leaders agreed to work together to enhance bilateral cooperation in all areas. They discussed in particular ways to strengthen cooperation and coordination in the context of ongoing effort against the COVID-19 pandemic. Meanwhile, a successful trial run of the train between Jayanagar in India and Kurtha in Nepal was undertaken on Sunday. The 34.5 kilometer long rail section is the first section of the rail line links between the two countries which connects Jayanagar in Madhubani district of Bihar to Kurtha in Mahutri district of Nepal. Costing 619 crore rupees, the Jayanagar Kurtha Railway link has been set up by IRCON under the India Nepal Friendship Rail Project with finance granted by the Indian government. The Chief Public Relations Officer of the East Central Railway, Rajesh Kumar, said that the train movement on this section will start soon after fulfilling technical and other formalities between two countries. The remaining 34 kilometer rail line will be built in two phases. The 17-kilometer long section, second section will link Kurta and Bangaha, while the third phase is 17-kilometer long and will extend from Banga to Bardibas. The Indian Railways has delivered two modern demo trains to Nepal for Jayanagar Kurta Railway link. Afghanistan has expressed deep concern over the remarks of the Pakistani Interior Minister on the ongoing investigation into the abduction of the Afghan ambassador's daughter. According to reports, the Pakistan Interior Minister Sheikh Rashid Ahmed claimed Indian involvement in the abduction of the Afghan envoy's daughter in Islamabad. Afghan Foreign Minister Mohammad Hanif Atmar spoke with Pakistani Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi and said that unprofessional remarks and premature judgments could strongly affect bilateral relations and the credibility of the ongoing and still incomplete investigation. Mr. Atmar, in a statement, reaffirmed Afghanistan's commitment to cooperate with the government of Pakistan in pursuing the investigation to apprehend and prosecute the perpetrators of the crime and to ensure the security of Afghan political missions and diplomats in that country. 
The statement added that to this end, an Afghan delegation will visit Pakistan and subsequent actions will be taken regarding the return of the Afghan ambassador and diplomats based on the delegation's assessments and findings. On Sunday, Afghanistan recalled its ambassador and senior diplomats from Pakistan until all security threats are addressed, including the arrest and trial of the perpetrators of abduction. First Vice President of Afghanistan tweeted that the abduction of the daughter of the Afghan ambassador and her subsequent torture has wounded the psyche of the nation. Fifteen diplomatic missions and the NATO representative in Afghanistan urged the Taliban to halt their military offensives just hours after the rival Afghan sides failed to agree on a ceasefire at a peace meeting in Doha. A delegation of Afghan leaders met the Taliban's political leadership in the Qatari capital over the weekend, but the Taliban, in a statement late on Sunday, made no mention of a halt to Afghanistan's escalating violence. NATO representatives on Monday said that the Taliban should lay down their weapons on the occasion of Eid al-Adha for good and show the world their commitment to the peace process. The statement also condemned rights violations such as efforts to shut schools and media outlets in areas recently captured by the Taliban. Taliban's spokesman in Doha, Mohammad Naeem, denied media reports that the insurgent group had agreed to an Eid ceasefire in exchange for the release of its prisoners. Meanwhile, President Ashraf Ghani on Monday reportedly visited the provincial capital of Herat province in the west. Meanwhile, 30 people were killed and 74 injured when a passenger bus and truck collided in Punjab province early Monday morning. Rescue officials said the accident occurred when a bus was in collision with a container truck in Dera Ghazi Khan district, 466 kilometers southeast of Lahore. The injured and dead were taken to a nearby hospital by the rescue service. A group of nations, including the European Union, the United Kingdom and NATO, joined the United States in strongly criticizing what is described as China's malicious cyber activities. In separate statements, the countries condemned China's irresponsible and destabilizing behavior in cyberspace. The White House, in a statement, implicated China's Ministry of State Security, MSS, in malicious cyber spionage operations. It added that attackers utilize the zero-day vulnerabilities in the Microsoft Exchange server. It also said that the U.S. and its allies are exposing China's use of criminal contract hackers to conduct unsanctioned cyber operations globally, including for their own personal profit. The U.K. also in a statement said that Chinese state-backed actors were responsible for gaining access to computer networks around the world via Microsoft Exchange servers. Japan also joined in, in the condemnation of China's cyber activities. In a statement, the Japanese Foreign Ministry said it is highly likely that the Chinese government is behind APT-40 and has been paying close attention with deep concern to these attacks. The APT-40 is the group allegedly behind the cyber attacks. India's Communications, Electronics and Information Technology Minister Ashwini Vaishnav emphatically denied all charges of snooping as false and baseless on Monday. In a statement in Lok Sabha on the Pegasus project, Mr. Vaishnav requested all members of the House to examine issues on facts and logic. He said the basis of this report is that there is a consortium that has got access to a leaked database of 50,000 phone numbers. He said the allegation is that individuals linked to these phone numbers are being spied upon. The minister, however, said that the report says that the presence of a phone number in the data does not reveal whether a device was infected by Pegasus or subjected to an attempted hack. Mr. Vaishnav said, without subjecting the phone to its technical analysis, it is not possible to conclusively state whether it witnessed an attempted hack or successfully compromised. Mr. Vaishnav said, in India, there is a well-established procedure through which lawful interception of electronic communication is carried out for the purpose of national security. This is All India Radio, giving you the world news. The centre is disseminating awareness of national helpline numbers for the benefit of citizens during the COVID-19 pandemic. The helpline number of the Health and Family Welfare Ministry is 1075. The child helpline number is 1098. For senior citizens of Delhi, Karnataka, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Tamil Nadu, Telangana, Uttar Pradesh and Uttarakhand, the helpline number is 14567. 
the helpline number of National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences Nimhans for psychological support is 08046110007 Ayush COVID-19 counseling helpline number is 14443 and MyGov WhatsApp help desk number is 9013151515 Welcome back to the world's news. India's cumulative COVID vaccination coverage has surpassed the 41 crore mark. As per the 7 p.m. provisional report on Monday, the cumulative figure stands at 41 crore 13 lakh 55,665. The Union Health Ministry of India in a statement said that the new phase of universalisation of COVID-19 vaccination commenced on the 21st of June, and more than 47 lakh 77,000 vaccine doses have been administered on Monday. Now let's take a look at the coronavirus updates from around the world. The World Health Organization (WHO) has announced a plan for the next phase of research to further explore all possible pathways of introduction of SARS-CoV-2 virus into the human population. The plan includes five areas of further inquiry including in China. However, the WHO proposal for the second phase of study did not include study of the role of cold chains in frozen foods which China resorted to many times as an excuse to stop the shipments from India and other countries. The proposal also calls for audits of relevant laboratories and research institutions operating in the area of the initial human cases identified in December 2019. The WHO plan was announced on Friday, a day after Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus urged Beijing to cooperate with the second phase of the study and to be transparent saying scientists still lacked enough raw data on infections and possible cases in the early days of the outbreak. However, Beijing said on Monday the World Health Organization's proposal for further research into the origins of COVID-19 is inconsistent with its position and the focus of the next phase of inquiry should move away from China. England on Monday moved to step 4 of its roadmap to the end of COVID-related restrictions. British Prime Minister in a statement said that the majority of COVID restrictions it emphasized upon exercising personal judgment and responsibility. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson called on all adults to get vaccinated. The statement added that cases continue to rise, but hospitalizations and deaths have substantially weakened due to the vaccination program. Meanwhile, Bangladesh recorded the highest number of COVID-19 deaths in a single day on Monday. 231 people died and 13,321 new cases of coronavirus infection were reported over the last 24 hours on Monday morning. The death toll in Bangladesh has gone up to 18,125. In today's hot spot section, we bring you a discussion on the political developments in Nepal. In conversation are Ashok Sajjanhar, former diplomat and Simran Sodhi, journalist. Ambassador Sajjanhar, what seems to be the beginning of some kind of political stability in Nepal. How much optimistic are you going forward that what we have seen in the last few months is instability this will at least temporarily come to a halt now i feel much more optimistic than i have felt for the last uh, at least 8 months as far as developments in nepal are concerned we must keep in mind that uh, instability has uh, dogged nepal for last many many years from 2008 till about 2017 18 within that period of 10 years there were changes of about 10 prime ministers which took place. so there was huge instability but after the election in 2017 as a result of which the former prime minister kp sharma oli he took oath of office in february of 2018 then we did see for a short while that there was some stability but then it was shaken up very badly when last year in december 2020 kp sharma only dissolved the parliament and he dissolved the parliament basically because uh, the opposition to him both within his own party the communist party of nepal as well as from the opposition parties including or particularly the nepalese congress led by sher bahadur deva that was increasing and from then we have seen really a roller coaster ride of instability because he dissolved the parliament and this was taken up in the supreme court 
by eight applications for the president Vidya Devi Bhandari had done. It was ultra wise the constitution. There was no provision in the constitution for dissolving the parliament and uh, the Supreme Court agreed with that position. In February, the Supreme Court decided that the parliament should be reinstated which was done in May, but then again, the Prime Minister in office, incumbent K.P. Sharma Oli, he was not able to win a vote of confidence. The leader of the opposition was invited. He also was not able to win a vote of confidence. And so again, the parliament was dissolved in May of 2021 on the night of 21st, 22nd May. And elections were set for November of this year. But now on the 12th of July, once again, the Supreme Court declared that this dissolution of the parliament was against the provisions of the constitution. And it declared that the leader of the opposition, Sher Bahadur Deba, he should be sworn in as the prime minister, which was done duly on the 13th of July. Now, the incumbent prime minister had up to a month or so to prove his majority in the parliament. But he was able to do it uh, yesterday on Sunday, that is on the 18th of July, when he won about 165 uh, votes in the parliament, much more than the 138 that was required. And there were just about 80 plus votes that were against him. So from now onwards, till uh, the end of 2022, that is November 22, when uh, the fresh elections are to be held, I can see that there should be stability because uh, there is not only the members of the Nepali Congress, but also of the Communist Party of Nepal Maoist Center, led by Pushp Kamal Dehal or Prachand, and some of the other parties like the Janta Samajwadi Party, like the Rashtriya Janamorcha Party, and also elements of the Communist Party of Nepal, unified Marxist Leninist, which is led by K.P. Sharma Oli. They are all supporting Sher Bahadur Daiba, so I can see that uh, there is great uh, possibility and uh, huge probability of uh, stability coming to Nepal, at least for the next one and a half years. Master Sajunhar, there's also been the fact that India has been watching very closely, but India has also maintained its distance from the domestic politics of Nepal as we have seen it unfolding. Do you feel that this is a strategy, this is something that India should continue doing, that we watch from a distance what happens in Nepal, while at the same time we are also keeping an eye on Nepal and China relationships. So that's a balancing act that India does in the neighborhood. Simran, I don't know whether I will use the expression that we should watch from a distance. What I would like to suggest is that India needs to be engaged very actively with the Nepal, you know, even uh, when we had this, uh, again, ups and downs in our relationship over the last one year. You would recall what K.P. Sharma Oli had done in June last year. First, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, terming uh, this virus, the coronavirus, which had come from India as being lethal, as being very virulent, and uh, then uh, changing the map of uh, the country by claiming that uh, the areas of uh, Kalapani, Lipule, Slimpaduria, that they were uh, belonged to Nepal and did not belong to India. So, you know, it had given all these uh, provocations uh, to which uh, India, of course, had provided a very strong uh, rebuke. But uh, that notwithstanding, we continue continued our engagement with the, the both with the government as well as with the people because uh, as you mentioned very rightly you know what the readout from the ministry of external affairs says that both the countries uh, share unique ties of friendship and uh, cooperation they are characterized by an open border they are uh, deep rooted people contacts of kinship and culture we have free movement across the borders we have uh, a huge border between us about 1850 kilometers and that that is uh, a peaceful border. So uh, our relations with Nepal are very, very special. And so irrespective of these provocations coming from uh, Mr. K.P. Sharma Oli, our developmental projects continued unabated. But uh, unlike uh, China, we don't interfere in the internal matters, in the internal affairs of any country. We did not uh, do that as far as Nepal is concerned. We allowed the Nepalese people, the Nepalese leaders of different parties to take uh, their own decisions, to choose the government of their own liking. 
And uh, this was very different to the manner in which uh, China conducted itself because even before that, if you would recall that in 2018, the two communist parties, the Communist Party of Nepal, Unified Marxist Leninist of T.P. Sharma Oli and Communist Party of Nepal, Maoist Center led by Prachand, both of them were brought together and uh, unified in the single Communist Party of Nepal in early 2018. And uh, the Chinese ambassador kept on engaging very proactively with uh, the Nepalese president, with the Nepalese prime minister, with the Nepalese foreign minister, basically interfering in the internal affairs. And when this dissolution of the parliament took place in December last year, there was in fact a very senior delegation that came to Nepal from uh, China, basically trying to get uh, the two factions of the Communist Party together. India has been keeping itself fully engaged. You would remember last year, we had our army chief visiting Nepal and uh, having uh, very good discussions uh, with uh, the Prime Minister and the President, our Foreign Secretary going there, carrying large number of medicines as far as uh, dealing with uh, the pandemic is concerned. Earlier this year, on in January, when we started our own vaccination drive, we provided 1.5 million vaccines uh, to Nepal. So while not interfering, we have uh, continued to stay very actively engaged. And I think that is uh, yielding us dividends. And now with uh, Sher Bahadur Daiba as the new prime minister, we can hope and expect that our relations will further strengthen and uh, will get further dynamism, as uh, Prime Minister Modi has mentioned in his uh, tweet and in his conversation with the new Prime Minister of Nepal. Mr. Sajunha, we also see that with Nepal, India has tradition and the centuries-old people-to-people ties. And culturally, traditionally, historically, India and Nepal have always been very close. Do you feel that to some extent we have to be more watchful and we have to be more wary as we see China making more and more attempts in the neighborhood? We've seen them making similar attempts in Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, for example. And in Nepal, as you had explained in detail, this political instability, we did see China trying to interfere more. Do you feel that India has to stay a little wary and on the edge as far as the Chinese factor is concerned when it comes to the India-Nepal relationship. We need, of course, to be very vigilant about it. But uh, frankly, there is no need to be wary or anxious about it. China, frankly, is a newcomer. It has certain strengths in terms of the fact that uh, it has very deep pockets. So under its, uh, whether it is the Belt and Road Initiative or some of the other uh, programs, it can reach out to these countries and provide them with infrastructure and provide them with uh, good uh, assistance and support. But uh, India, I think, has many great strengths and India has also started reaching out in terms of creating uh, infrastructure projects in these countries, giving out uh, grant assistance, for instance, We've seen that Nepal has been very badly hit by the COVID crisis. And do you feel that the fact that India has also stepped up to help with the COVID vaccinations and India has actually been a partner to Nepal in this is also one instance where this relationship is further strengthened? Battling against COVID-19 is a very important area where both the countries have uh, collaborated. Now, unfortunately, because of the second wave in uh, India, we have not been able to supply more of the vaccines to Nepal uh, just yet. But uh, I am quite confident that now we have three vaccines in India which we are using. Very soon, we should have some of the others like Pfizer, like Moderna. We should also have some of the more indigenous vaccines uh, coming onto the market. So we should uh, be in a position to help out uh, Nepal in this instance. But, uh, of course, uh, we have been also in touch with some of the other partners like uh, Europe, the European countries, EU, United States, which have been supplying vaccines to Nepal to make up for the shortage of vaccines going from India. We will be ready to help Nepal and all our other neighbors in this regard. And with these comments, we bring today's discussion to an end. Thank you. Thank you.
In China, two dams have collapsed in Hulu and Buir in the northwestern region of Inner Mongolia after heavy rainfall. The Water Ministry said on Monday that the dams collapsed on Sunday afternoon, highlighting the safety risks posed by aging infrastructure during the summer flood season. People living downstream were evacuated with no casualties reported, it said. According to Holon Boer's city government, 16,660 people were affected, 21,708 hectares of farmlands flooded and 22 bridges destroyed. Other transport infrastructure had also been destroyed. Moving on to sports in cricket, India to take on Sri Lanka in the second ODI of the three-match series at the R. Premadasa Stadium in Colombo on Tuesday. The match is scheduled to begin at 3 p.m. IST. In the first ODI played on Sunday, India won by seven wickets. Chasing a victory target of 263 runs set by Sri Lanka, India achieved the target in 36.4 overs with Shikhar Dhawan's unbeaten 86 and 95 balls and Ishan Kishan's 59 in 42 balls. Pritzi Shaw, who made 43 in 24 balls, was named player of the match. With this win, India has taken a 1-0 lead in the three-match series. The third and final ODI will be played on the 23rd of this month. Both the countries are also scheduled to play three T20 matches starting from the 25th of July. In cycling, Tadej Pogacar won the second consecutive successful Tour de France in Paris on Sunday. Prabhu Ashish Patnaik of Bhubaneswar is the winner of the Sunday's edition of the Olympic quiz with the IR. Prabhu Ashish Patnaik is a class 5 student. Many congratulations to her from the entire team of AIR News. Speaking to AIR News, Prabhu Ashish Patnaik expressed her happiness on winning the Olympic quiz and wished the Indian Olympic contingent the best for Tokyo Olympics. I am very happy to win All India Radio Olympic Quiz Contest. I am thankful to All India Radio News. My best wishes to Indian athletes. I wish they win medals for India and make India proud. All India Radio's Olympic Quiz launched on 1st of this month has received a tremendous response from across the country. Hundreds of listeners have emailed their responses. To take part in the Olympic Quiz, tune into a sports scan program. And now let's take a look at the major developments around the world as reported in the foreign press. Washington Post writes that Facebook isn't sharing how many Americans view the vaccine misinformation. Wall Street Journal reports that Haiti's interim Prime Minister Claude Joseph has agreed to step down and hand power to a political challenger. The Globe and the Mail reports that ExxonMobil appoints former Diageo executive Catherine Michels as chief financial officer. South China Morning Post writes that K-pop singers contract coronavirus as South Korea struggles with the surge in infections. Khalid Times reports that the new sweeping COVID safety measures go into effect in Abu Dhabi. A quick look at the headlines once again. Prime Minister Narendra Modi congratulates Nepali counterpart Sher Bahadur Deuba on winning confidence vote. Both leaders agree to enhance bilateral cooperation. Afghanistan condemns Pakistan's remark on ongoing investigation into the abduction of Afghan ambassador's daughter as unprofessional and premature. U.S. and its allies join in condemning China's malicious cyber activities over the Microsoft Exchange server's hacking. India's Communications, Electronics and Information Technology Minister denies all charges of snooping as false and baseless. England moves into step four of its roadmap to end COVID-related restrictions. Over 41 crore doses of COVID vaccines administered in India under nationwide vaccination drive. And in cricket, India will take on Sri Lanka in second ODI three-match series in Colombo on Tuesday. India is celebrating the 151st birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. Before we end, let us listen to his favorite bhajan, Vaishnav Jan by Artis from Nepal.
And with that, we end this bulletin. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow with the next edition of World News.